Hey everybody, this is History After Hours podcast. This is a very special episode. We just got back a couple days ago from our tour of Italy. We landed in Milan. We hit Venice. We hit Padua. We hit Bologna. We hit Florence. We hit Pisa. We hit Rome. We hit Pompeii, Sorrento, the island of Capri. We went from top to bottom. It was a great experience. We took nearly 70 people, mostly students. We joined with another tour group from Sheridan, Arkansas, led by Bill Remo, who taught me in high school. And we just had a great time. And we saw so much stuff. And our plan was to record a small little podcast at the end of every day to kind of recap what we've seen so we could have kind of a digital recording of it the whole week. But really, it got impossible because sometimes we, we didn't get back to the hotel till nearly, you know, 11 or 12 and we were tired. And so, but we were able to record several episodes. Uh, we had several students who joined in and helped us out in the recording. So you'll hear them occasionally throughout reflecting on what we've seen. We tried to do our best to, to kind of recap the days that we, we had. We also have an exclusive interview with our fabulous Italian tour director. His name is Dario. You will love him. It was just an awesome time, as these trips always are. Uh, Next year, the plan is Paris and London, and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to record a podcast and try to share with you what we see in these places. And um, we had an awesome time. Once again, a shout out to Abby Hanks, who is having to take all these recordings and edit them together to make something functional out of them. We couldn't do it without her, so a big shout out to her. And, um, you know, I can't say enough about the trip and about Italy and how significant it is to travel and to see all these places. So, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this special podcast. Thank you. All right, so we just went to Venice. It is now late. I don't know what time it is. What time is it? Nine. Yeah. On a Tuesday night on March 20th. March 20th. Okay, so this. Okay, so this we're coming to you from Italy, History After Hours, and we've got some students that are going to um, help us out with this, and we're going to reflect on what we did today. We're going to try to do this every night so we can have a digital copy of our journey. Audio so. diary, yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, all right. So let's just let's talk about Venice. We woke up, we drove, got on a ferry boat, and went to Venice. Yeah, well, what ha- let's talk about what happened yesterday in Venice. What happened yesterday in Venice? It snowed. I have no. Yeah, snow and rain and more snow. And as we drove in, we saw snow like piled up on the sides of the road. And I was thinking, oh, <laughs> well, we were worried it was going to snow or rain. Yeah, it would be miserable, but it wasn't that bad. The sun came out. No, yeah, it was bright and sunny. Oh, wait, nice. So cold. Okay, so let's run down. What did we see, Noah? I saw a lot of colorful buildings and not many people, surprisingly. That was the biggest surprise for me is that you think it would be like a really busy city throughout like in New York or Los Angeles, but there really weren't many people in the streets once you got away from the tourist attractions. Yeah. It was, it was really calm. It was really quiet in some places, too. I, I like that about it. But, uh, yeah, if you've never been to Venice, it's super narrow streets, high buildings. You can get lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, and today there was a high tide, so we had water flowing out into the square. Oh, yeah, that was neat. I didn't, I didn't expect that. Like uh-huh. It's designed to drain in and out like that, you know. And flooding is a normal part of life. Yeah. So, yeah. What did you think about? Okay, so the first thing we did actually was we saw a glass sculpting thing. Amazing. That was cool. Take some skill. When they made the horse. <laughs> We talked about Louis the Fourteenth. Uh, Fourteenth, yeah, the Sun King, Louis the Fourteenth, when uh, he designed, when they closed in their back balcony and made the Hall of Mirrors. Uh, one of the things that he wanted to do to impress people was to have just an entire hallway like no one had ever seen before, and all of the glass in that hall, on the windows and on the mirrors themselves that line the place, all of it is Venetian glass. I mean, it was it was really? hand blown right so here. It was, it was, yeah, it was made right here. Time too. Made right here and then shipped and to also, France. It's amazing. Yeah, it's super yeah. expensive. Like that, you might as well haul gold in. Because that right. cost, to have a good mirror, like mm. that's not just glass. To have a mirror. <laughs> right. You can't just buy that anywhere at your, yeah. at your corner and you store. Can, and if you go to Versailles and go to the Hall of Mirrors, you, you can, that's some of the original glass. Wow. It's still there. Like it's kinda, Franklin it's, looked in that glass. It's kind of wavy. It's kind of weird because, you know, technically, even though glass is 
it looks like a solid. It's technically still a liquid. Really? Yeah, I don't know how that exactly works. I have to ask my physics people on that one. But that's what I've heard. That it it's shapes. It's, it's not it's, straight. Yeah, I think straight. that's why the, the warping can, can be a thing. Do you know about this? I mean, I just thought it was interesting seeing today. All right, well, say who you are because we don't know yet. Because this is all audio, oh, right? I'm sorry. There uh, you go. My name is Matt Mangan. Who's the second one? Uh, oh. That was uh, that was Noah McClanahan. There you go. Everybody he's, knows he's been on the there, just on. Noah. He's a one he's a, a one name wonder, he's a right? Um, I thought it was really interesting seeing uh, the sculptor that we saw today. Uh, they said that. The, that you mean when you did the horse? You mean? Um, yeah, the the one who did the horse. Yeah. And um, that that one the one vase. Um, I thought it was really interesting how that was a skill that had been passed down from multiple generations, uh, and that right. was kind of a family like a family tradition, and how like. Something like that is so interesting because, um, you know, you don't you don't see a, you know, you see a lot of like small businesses in, in America and, and things like that or like a certain skill passed down from generation to generation. But it's really cool to see that like in action, um, you know, in foreign countries and, and see how family is such a uh, important factor to, um, you know, to the arts and you know, things like that. Oh. So that, that's what I found interesting. Oh. Get, we were th th was it was it you guys that we were talking with after we saw that and we talked about how they discovered glass making yeah 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 that to me like you don't just wake up and go well i think i'm gonna blow some glass today like you don't do that like somebody had to, somebody somewhere had to finally figure out that those elements he said it was help me it was and lime and sand and, lime sand and something silica else. maybe no so, what was silica. it was the other was the third thing I don't know. lime yeah. sand silica sounds right and, and the fact that that dude just yeah. was like oh I'll like, just, I'll just try do this. you think that I, in my head it's like some ancient person digging through after they've had a fire, yeah. and and they like there's and then here's this glass in the middle. And they go, how'd that get there? Like that's what, to me that's how that sort of began. Maybe well, I actually learned this from the ACT surprise. Oh, okay, what you learned from the ACT, but we there was a reading passage, and it was the I guess the more sciencey one, and apparently there was an asteroid that struck Earth, and the temperature was so hot in the desert that it created glass. It's called like desert glass. Yeah, but we're not anywhere near a desert, so but how did that somebody way out in the desert discovered that they could and make they brought it to Venice <laughs> and then brought it here? I don't know. I, I have no clue, but yeah, that would be. I, could actually could have happened. We need to research that though, like the history of glass. I don't. Yeah, so ancient people maybe. Right. Right. How many, did y'all go in the palace? Uh, we did not go in the palace. We oh, did you? Yeah. I I, I, I went in the palace. What was your favorite? Okay, so let's talk the, about the palace. How's right, okay, the Doge's Palace is the, uh, the actually, and I didn't realize this until we went in, because I, I, I just assumed it was make, um, like, the, the apartments and whatnot, you know, but it was also where they held court. You know, they yeah. had the different council chambers and that kind of stuff, so that was pretty neat to see. Right, yeah. uh, but the Doge's were, are basically um, the kings. kings of Venice, right, when it was, even before it was a republic, right? Yeah, oh, well, I don't know. Yeah, but I think during so. their time of independence, before yeah. they got conquered by Napoleon. Right. So, so they have all, an armory in there full of swords. They had a sword in there. Okay, let's talk about the big swords because I, I we've seen I've seen all kinds of sword slashing movies, right? It's pretty wild. I've never seen a sword that's like what was it, twelve feet yeah, probably. <laughs> How do you? I, the only thing I can maybe think of is like dudes on horseback just coming down on somebody. Maybe. I mean, maybe maybe, maybe it was a maybe could it was you a two swing man, that maybe sword? It was a two man sword. <laughs> two, 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 <laughs> two people man. wielding it. Maybe. Hey. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was very. Get your local giant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very very impractical. Yeah, that, that those were impressive. And then the, you you saw you had pictures of the horse armor, right? That was pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, so. Did you see that? Somebody had that. No, yes. No. I. I, I Is saw that you? It. Oh, okay. All right. So, all right, we'll talk about what you thought that was cool. Okay, well, so I remember one specific room where, um, you know, there was, there was, like, a lot of art in, you know, there's a lot of art in this one section. I remember just, like, talking with my friends, and I wasn't really paying attention, um, just, like, kind of walking through complacently. And then I just, like, looked up, and they, you know, they walked on. And then I probably spent 10 minutes just, like, looking at the ceiling of this, of this like, these beautiful – it was separated by this, like, you know – like a one single golden frame that like held all every single one of them and 3D gilded. Yeah, yeah, it was like it, it was magnificent. Like I, I was, it was beyond words. And yeah, er, and every every nook and cranny was decorated too. Like exactly, you, there was yeah. not a place without decoration. There was not a place where it wasn't like that. But I think I think for some reason like there was this, this one room yeah. where I like felt a felt a separate connection with. I, I don't I don't even know why, but. 
I, we I went down to the prison part of it, and that was kind of creepy. The dungeon, like we went down two flights of stairs, it dropped like 20 degrees, and I immediately thought, how many thousands, thousands of people who died in this prison were screaming? Yeah, that's why that creepy. that that gives that bridge of size thing a whole new. Yeah, because you the like doors, a, the wooden doors were like six, seven inches thick, and then everything was just concrete brick, and then they had a hole. And I know that it's about this big. Can you imagine them? Can you imagine being marched out. down into a place like that and just saying, "Well, this, you know, life is actually over. This is it. This is it." Oh my god. Yeah, and yeah. that like that's that's a feeling that I had through like a lot of this, a lot of this trip is, is seeing the. Life is over. Yeah. No, 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 no. Sorry, that's not what I meant. Sorry. Let me make this clear. Uh, okay. Yes. The, the feeling of like, you know, let me in retrospect being like how people felt in context of the time period. Right, right. And, like, how, um, you know, seeing these certain things where, like, we learned about this in class. Like, like we, we talked about this theoretically, but we're here. Like, like, like mm-hmm. we're seeing this firsthand. I thought that was, I thought that was yeah, really cool. Yeah, Marco Polo walked where you walked to. Yeah. Like, That's where his starting point before he went to China was where you were at. And Napoleon, because he came through as a tourist and, and then Napoleon stayed. There, yeah. yeah. I think yeah, I'll just like, keep this. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. You know, I kind of like this. Yeah. Just, what else about Venice? Um, let's talk. So we talked about the Doge's Palace that we right. visited, the ferry boat we got out there in. Oh, with the way yeah, we took the gondola around. Yeah, the gondolas. Did y'all ride the gondolas? Ride the gondolas. That's something famous you got to do, right? Did anybody have an interesting experience? Well, they made me, the guy at the very <laughs> beginning, told me to sit on the left to to balance it out for him. But we actually had more people on the left. So we were slightly tilted the entire time, <laughs> teetering on, on, a, on the brink on an axis. of tipping. But every t- I tried to switch over, he'd be like, "No," he'd just say, "No." Yeah, he he, sp- he spoke Spanish actually. We we found a lot of people here spoke Spanish yeah. because they're very similar languages. Right. So uh, so we talked a lot to a lot of people in Spanish because we couldn't speak Italian if they don't speak English. So yeah, the gondola rides in Venice. I mean, it's the only place in the world you do this, so you got to right. do that. That's right. one it's of the things you got to check off the list. Absolutely. Um, what else? Is there anything else about Venice that we need to mention? We've only got a few minutes left. We're going to ah. keep these podcasts kind of short every night right. just to recap what we've right. did, done. What else did you do? You what else? What did you say that you thought was cool? Any, I mean, anything. Well, there there were abundant, an abundance of churches, I learned. Ex- all were extremely ornate. We went in a few. Relatively you know, small area. Right. But And I keep... I kept thinking I was in the same place because there'd be a square, there'd be a tower, and there would be a church, and they're they all kind of look the same, but they're all they're all completely different inside. But um, it, it was kind of interesting to see how like how important religion was to people. Like you have one every corner, pretty much throughout the entire city. Yeah, and well, every city is going to be a lot every like city. that. There's just cathedrals and churches, and Rome's probably the has the most churches. Oh the man, the yeah. All right, so one of the things that stood out to me, and maybe you guys caught this when you were looking at the map, did you notice, and he even suggested that we go here, uh, over to the Jewish uh, part of town, right? And it says, still on the map, it says uh, the it says ghetto on there. Really? And so remember, like, because several of these guys are in my, in my AP Euro class, so think about how much we've talked about the separation and the segregation of certain groups of people, and especially, uh, particularly the Jewish populations in Europe. That is prime example right there of how you have, I mean, it, it, today it's not segregated, but at the same time, they still hold the, uh, if you go back far enough, the, the name still holds that connotation, that there was a separation in, in society. Was that self-separation? Uh, separ- uh, probably not. Probably not. Mussolini started tracking down. He really? Was yeah. You hear about the anti-Semitic. But, it was, but I mean, I, no, I'm, talking about, I'm just talking about historic, even before. Like, we're talking about, you know, 11, 1200s, it's still a thing, right? Way back then. So, yeah. And then going back to the Napoleon story, when it, part of the, the – Part of the laws that he passed was the emancipation of the Jewish citizens across different parts of Europe, and so there would have been a more of an integration, which would have caused some friction because they have to figure out now how to get along, right? Mm-hmm. If I mean, according to the law, they had to. So then what, right? Then yeah. we come, we break on up into the 1900s with more segregation than before. I, anyway, I just thought it was kind of interesting that we still you still have those zones that are labeled, even though they're not forced. You still feel those effects today. Yeah, it's interesting. Right. Okay, so we're staying at a hotel uh, outside of Venice, and this hotel name is, what's the name? Anybody? Uh, what? Jalisco. 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 Okay, Jalisco. And it's about, uh, I don't know, 1,000? 1, yeah, 1,200. 1,200 feet from the uh, sea. Adriatic Tony, Sea. would you yeah. like to tell people what you just did? Yeah. <laughs> all right, so yeah, give us, all right, say your name. Uh, my name is Jonah Nestor. And, t- and hopefully your mama's going to listen to this. All right, go. <laughs> all right, all right. So, okay, we're sharing this. <laughs> okay, so 
So uh, I was, we, we were leaving the room, and so I didn't put a jacket or anything on. So we walked down to the beach, and the wind's, wind's blowing probably a good 20 to 30 miles, you say, <laughs> probably. Might I remind people that it snowed here yesterday. It snowed, it snowed yesterday. It's sub 40 degrees. <laughs> Socks and sandals, we get to the beach, and as soon as we get to, like, the sand, just, the sand's blowing. It hits me in the, everyone in the eyes, and we're just like, ah. And so we just kind of turn and walk towards the water, and we get to where, like, there's a boat, like a sand dune kind of set up, and there's, like, 50 yards to the water, so I just walked down, put my feet in there, kind of stand for a while. <laughs> like a man, I was it, waiting for you to dive in. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about it, no, no, <laughs> jump. I was like, oh, I mean, my feet are in here, I'm all sandy, might as well get in there, but I don't know. The so that was, been nice. yeah. so that was a unique experience. Yeah, it was fun. So you yeah, just dipped cool. your toes there. Yeah. Okay, well, today was Venice. Right. We'll talk about food, we'll talk about everything else. Um, tomorrow, we are doing Padua and Bologna. And Bologna. Right. So we'll have a recap of that uh, on part two of our Italian adventure. Traveling. Okay, so this is actually day three, I think. Time warp. Okay, so last night we got in way too late, so we skipped a day. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be doubling up on this podcast and talking about our last two days in Italy. So uh, what did we do two days ago? I don't even remember. It's a blur. It it is kind of a blur. Okay, so we ended up, we went to the Scrovegni Chapel yesterday and then we ended up in Bologna okay, so so, so we were in Padua we were in Padua 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 and that was that was much more of an experience than I even realized it was going to be like I, th- I knew there were some Giotos in there I didn't know that it was like Sistine Chapel kind of mm-hmm. you know had a feel to it even though it was before right yeah uh, baking family that was I, I was I was moved I, I really it, I was really Awesome to okay, see. Okay, so, yeah, for me to be in Italy several times, I never went to either one of these cities. So, Padua and Bologna. In Padua, I think all we really did was that. Yeah, yeah, that was the it. The Scrovini Chapel. Check it out. Also, some of us ran. You were with us. Yes. And we ran to see a uh, sculpture. The bronze sculpture. By Donatello. Yeah, Donatello. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. All right, so what was your, what, what did you think about this? this okay. Let's start with Padua. All right. You tell us what you think about this. Say the your name so we know uh, who's Oh, yeah, my name is Matt Mangan. Um. So, uh, talking specifically about that the statue or just whatever you want to uh, give us give us your rundown. Again, of that it thing. is kind of it is a blur. Um, however, the Scre- the Scrivini Chapel, um, Scrivini Chapel, as uh, as Mr. Franklin was saying, was much more than what I bargained for, in my opinion. Um, I uh, I got to just basically what happened was it was a big group and they were splitting us all up. Uh, and you know there was one group of Sheridan and there was one group of Lakeside and I didn't really know a ton of people from Sheridan um, but they needed more people so I just kind of jumped in there and uh, so I got to I wasn't really with a lot of people there wasn't a lot of talking and I was and I got to fully experience it uh, at its full depth and I thought that that really served served me well and I, I got I walked in there and really was not expecting it to blow me away like it did uh, especially you know the um, the scene of, like, uh, whenever you walk in, the wall, like, right, right adjacent to, or right adjacent towards you was, you know, Jesus in the middle, and then on the left side, it's, you know, the depiction of heaven, and, and you know, angels, and, you know, little little baby, baby, you know, <laughs> wings everywhere, <laughs> and then on the right, it's, it's like, this depiction of hell, and these awful beasts, and uh, just, like, really, really intricate, detailed, like, um, it's really interesting. Yeah, opinion. so what we're talking about is a chapel really out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, this is yeah. kind of... This Felt like the, it, yeah. This Padua, this is kind of their claim to fame is this chapel. And it was built by a fa- banking family to really try to get, I think, his father out of purgatory because he was featured in yeah. the Divine Comedy. The, the idea... Okay, <laughs> so for for history uh, vocabulary, the word usurer is something we throw out there. And what that... Uh, actually is is a, a a banker who charges an interest rate and it was illegal it was actually something the church frowned upon for a long time you were, it was considered a major sin you could go to hell for it if nothing else you go to, to purgatory to try to work your way out through it maybe it wasn't too bad an interest rate i guess <laughs> you know you weren't too bad a loan shark so yeah so this uh, uh scrovegna guy is his father you know the whole family was banking so the idea was that he was going to build this chapel as sort of penance for his father and that way that we could help him work himself out and it's maybe make it to heaven, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, it is gorgeous. Let's talk about Giotto real quick, though, because I want to make sure people know who that is. Okay. The, this is a early uh, 1300s. Uh, Giotto mm-hmm. is really considered the guy who brings us out of 
uh, sort of medieval slash Byzantine era, weird sort of alien esque flat paint. He's the guy that's transitioning to Renaissance type paintings where you have more realism and humanism and emotions and perspective. perspective, right? Some atmospheric perspective and linear. So that's that guy. And you can see this is what's cool about it because we, we, we teach about a few of these things in uh, in my Euro class, some of the specific paintings that we saw there. And you can, it's not perfect, but you can see him working it out, right? You can see him doing that math. And so it's yeah, that Jotel was awesome. Was the early Renaissance, and you can tell the difference. It is flatter. It's not quite as. He's almost my, he's almost pre Renaissance. Tell you the truth, Michelangelo yeah. is like Giotto 2.0. So if you're familiar right. with the Sistine Chapel, the Last Judgment, you know that's what um, Matt was talking about on the wall. Uh, and if so, if you're familiar with that image, Giotto did that before Michelangelo mm. did it. Now, of course, this place didn't have the ceiling like the Sistine Chapel, but the walls really replicate what Michelangelo it's did. It's a really scene. similar thing, yeah. I really love the blue that he hit there, too, just the, mm. that. On the uh, ceiling? You know, yeah, and I didn't know oh, this until the they told us that the, the concept of the eight-pointed star mm. representing eight the eighth day. Resurrection. Right. That I'd never really, I'd everything, never heard that symbolism before. Everything in there is symbolic. Yeah. It's, it's stunning. All right, so all right, so say your name since you're speaking now. I'm Noah McConaughey. All right, say things. But, <laughs> all right, so Scrovini Chapel. Uh, I I walked in and first you got depressurized. We got all the moisture sucked out of us so we wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> mess up the paintings. It's high tech. And uh, yes. what caught my eye was something we talked about in class. Okay. And and like you're saying, this is a transition between this old medieval like what who are these people like I don't understand this and Renaissance emotion and and depth. And there's a there's a certain scene because the entire chapel it depicts the life of Jesus. And there's one where I believe he's coming he's coming off the cross. Is that, is that the, the, the and there's the perspective of every head is turned toward oh right and yeah the the lamentation yeah and yeah. and it's the first perspective I had seen and for me the tri- I, like I finally realized like oh I'm here I'm in Italy, I'm in Italy I'm seeing what I the can the moment see. has happened yeah it was, it was kind of my moment <laughs> yeah and it, it was beautiful I didn't expect that to be in Padua which was kind of a modern city just yeah in the middle of it yeah, I'm glad we I'm glad we put that on the tour I, yeah, I think we, it was really absolutely. worth it we yeah. didn't get to stay long hour and a half or so mm-hmm. two hours. And then we took off. Mm-hmm. So, anything else about Padua t- before we move on to Bologna? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, Ian your name for the record. Name. <laughs> so, um, I was in the more modern part of Padua. I didn't see the Scrivini Chapel because I uh, didn't sign up for it. But I, w- <laughs> yeah, I was in the main city, and it was a really drastic change from what I saw in Venice, which is kind of an older city, and there's not that many people. Like, if I like Padua seemed like a city I would like to live in. Like, it wasn't huge, but like it was pretty it was good size but the streets were not crowded at all and i felt like there was a lot to do there and there was like a lot of modern stores and modern storefronts mm. awesome um yeah i mean we like i said we were running around pretty crazy after we just got to really look at the chapel and that's all of the time we had and then we take off down the road and within what an hour and a half again we were in a very new uh, a brand new city called bologna and Bologna typically is kind of the uh, communist capital of Italy, apparently. Um, it was an interesting city. It's a university city. Uh, has the oldest university in the... In o- Italy, par- the, Italy. The Parisian uh, uh, university was a little before. I, uh, I'm not sure exactly how many, how many years before. But anyway, so they're the both, both are from around the 1100s. Uh, when, uh, and, and they stemmed out of, out of uh, monasteries that had sort of kept the knowledge and things from um, through medieval times. Universities as we think of them today, not like ancient Greek. Well, they're t- uh, yeah, they're well, they're, 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 they're going to start reclaiming things like, you know, true, you know, styling rhetorics and histories and, and math and arts and sciences. So, you you know, it's, it's but it kind of develops. It takes a while, right? Right. And for a long time we had, this is sort of the, as we developed those eras, that scholasticism that we've talked about where they were trying to force science and religion to be the same thing and it wasn't quite working out the same way. So, you know, that has its moment. But, yeah. This is that's the foundation. So to to be in that place where you have the oldest and nearly the oldest university, modern university in Europe. And I think about that. We talked about this on the bus. The oldest university in the United States was or is Harvard University, which developed in the 1600s. And we were still in colonial time or, you know, colonial. That's era. young by comparison. But it is. <laughs> yeah. So for for these, they're half a millennia older than our oldest university in the United States, if that puts that in perspective for you. It, it just ties to how we forget about how young the United States is in We're general. babies. <laughs> we are babies <laughs> in the world stage. These people have been around. 
Yeah, when you think about, I was we were walking through Florence, and I said, hey, see that building? Older than George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it was standing when George Washington was born. Wow. And, you know, we just don't have anything like this comparatively. That's why I think it's so important to travel to these cities. What was your overall, uh, anybody can answer this, uh, kind of the vibe you got from Bologna as compared to Venice, as compared to Padua? It was definitely my favorite because we I came here thinking about Renaissance and thinking about more modern things, obviously, in Padua, as Ian said. But <coughs> you go into Bologna, and I thought, I thought for a second I was like in Frankfurt or something. It was, it was, it was medieval. Like there was cobblestone and <laughs> winding streets and little alleys. And I kind of got lost in there for a few hours with some other people. We, we were just going and kind of trying to experience everything. And that's, that's kind of what like the spirit of the trip is. But I, I thought it was beautiful just to, to see that. And then you'd have, you'd have this medieval architecture, but in the middle you'd have like a, like a modern cafe. Are, are like any of you guys store. having trouble with the, with the language differences? Because there's no, a lot of people. No, actually quite a few speak English. Yeah, I mean, you usually don't have too much trouble because most people can at least speak enough English to where we can. Yeah, but you get said around. you guys were saying that you s- you speak enough Spanish that it kind of blends. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a couple. So a couple of us, uh, like, <laughs> I mean, I only have three. I only have three years, but uh, I found myself, and this is kind of you know off of history a little bit, but uh, I found myself whenever you are, you know, interacting with people of this culture and just fully immersing yourself, like the words just come to you and it's and it's a weird it's a weird sensation because like i, I know like in a classroom setting you know you're kind of joking around it's kind of awkward you talking you talking spanish you know talking in spanish to your friends and stuff but whenever you whenever that is your like form of communication like it's you know it's it's go time and you're so, like you like you're on the ball and it's it's really interesting like and i've gotten a lot of op- like opportunities to interact with people and uh Use whatever I mean. Use what little Spanish I know, but to have a conversation, and I think it's I think it's cool. I mean, a, a, a lot of the differences oh, yeah. in is it's almost just a slight pronunciation difference. Mm-hmm. They're real close. Yeah. Oh yeah. So Bologna was full of college age kids. Once mm-hmm. again, kind of a university city, even though it's a very good typical example of a middle age, medieval top city because some of all those buildings are still standing. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of an interesting little Don't you like it when you me. see the when you walk into the place and you realize that you've entered that sort of medieval moment and you uh, every single time and we saw them on the drive today too these these massive thick walls, right? And you build those back in the day because you I mean the only reason to have a fortification is because nobody can knock those down and try to you're protecting yourself from somebody, right? Or somebody's, yeah. Yeah, Chris, you have something? Yes. All right, go ahead. Um, I'm Chris. Make, make sure that's make sure that things popped up there. Up. Oh. There you go. Okay. All right. I'm Chris Miller, and uh, in Bologna, uh, we saw many graduates because it was a uh, graduating season uh, for them, and they were always d- they were all doing a d- very odd tradition to what we do. Uh, they were all wearing like leaves on their head, and uh, some of them. Were yeah, the laurels. Costumes. Did you see that? I actually asked somebody because I didn't know. I was like, "Are they getting married? What is this?" And they were like, "No, they're they get they earned their bachelor's degree." Yes, yeah, so that's a good observation. Um, and some of them like were wearing, like I think I saw someone wearing a chicken costume. Someone else was wearing like uh, pink hair or um, yellow hair and like a uh, sailor uniform or something like that. Yeah, I think that's yeah. They they're marched they're them out graduating there. Graduating, so they take them out for a, a night on the town <laughs> in Bologna. I, I did find out also that a lot of restaurants close between the hours of two thirty and about seven. Yeah, that was we found we that out the hard way, didn't we? <laughs> because <laughs> I was looking forward to digging into what they had been promoting as one of the best Italian cities for eating right. for our whole tour. And like Tortellini, it's the birthplace mm. of Tortellini and all this stuff. And um, yeah, I just had to pop in to get something quick because we couldn't find a restaurant. But you know, that happens. And with that eating, uh, I have a little anecdote. So everything was closed pretty much when we got there. So so we had three main groups. We had we had some, some girls and we had some guys and we had a lot of parents. And we all split up and we're like, all right, we're going to go eat and we're going to meet back here. So we go to a restaurant, and we go upstairs, and we're like, wow, we found this. Like, wow, this is awesome. And we go upstairs, and the girls are there. And five minutes later, all of the parents show up, completely <laughs> independent of each other. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else was closed, and you had yeah, to go there. Yeah, the only restaurant. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I took a wrong turn, apparently, because uh, yeah, we, we didn't make it. We ended up with, a, like, a Hot Pocket. <laughs> <laughs> of course, an Italian Hot Pocket's better than an American one. I was going to say that. It's fresher. <laughs> More. Yeah. But they gave us a little extra time. 
So we left Bologna to come to the hotel, and this hotel is called, I never know the names of the hotels. Biondi. 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 Uh, there are, this is a chain. I've seen several of these all over Europe. But um, So we're staying, we didn't get here last night till 11. Right. So it was a, a big deal or a big thing to try to finally get to sleep. So we decided to skip the podcast to today. Now, let's move on now to day three. Yep. Which this was a big day, and we knew this coming in, this was going to be a big day because this is Pisa slash Florence, uh, and so what we did is we and split the group and because two. of the uh, because of the chapel that we went, we kind of had to squeeze a day and a half into one day, so that made it really busy. Yes, uh, this was the most frantic day I think I've ever had on a tour, just trying to get some stuff done because we only got for me the group that went to Pisa. Really, we did Pisa. And then you get just a, a little bit of time in Florence and no hardly any free time at all. So we had to really pack it in there today. By the way, if you're hearing a bunch of stuff in the background, that's because we're doing this in a hotel lobby <laughs> in Italy. So um, hopefully we can edit out some of that background noise, but it'll be fine either way. Um, if so not, enjoy the ambiance. All right, so let's take – who? raise your hand if you went to Pisa. All right, so one Okay, so everybody raises Pisa. their hand. Okay. One small thing about Pisa. When we first got off the bus, we had tr- people trying to peddle sunglasses to us. Oh, the sunglass crew was there? Yeah. Yeah, those boys, yeah. What about selfie stick guy? Was he there? Um, he, was. he was. Yeah, he was okay. Like, on, like, as we were walking off the bus, trying to... S- sunglass uh, man to was... Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's very typical. In oh, a Ty- Tyler hasn't... Area. Tyler didn't get to speak yet. Oh, no, no, no. I thought you wanted to. Okay. No, go ahead. Yeah, I was just right. this Say name. Master, um, name. Pizza. So, like, when Say we your name. Um, Jonah Nestor. There you go. Yeah, we got we get we get to Pisa and um, we show up and it's like a small town. I didn't really see a lot of people. It was one of like, lots of buses, so it was, I could tell it was very touristy. And so we get there, and we walk into the main square, and I see this like immaculate. Uh, it was a baptistry. It was like an octagon, kind of like a dome. And I was like, wow, I didn't expect there to be this really cool like structure near the Tower of Pisa because I thought like the main attraction would be the main Tower of Pisa. And I thought it would be like kind of like an open area with just that. And there's also a really cool cathedral, so I thought it was interesting. Like it was different than I thought it was really going to be. Did you get to go inside those buildings? Yes, we did. Yeah. yeah. They're gorgeous, right? Yeah. They're <laughs> yeah. It was, it was awesome. These boys were all about, let's decorate that up and celebrate some God. Yeah, and, and you, you see this, all of you have seen the Leaning Tower your whole life. But to see it, you can't, you can't take a picture of it and go home and say, hey, this is what it, they, what they won't get the experience. Yeah, so uh, when we got there, I was uh, really excited to uh, go in the tower because, I mean, I've seen this tower and it was like, it's iconic. So I go to the bo- the base trying to go up in it, and you have to have these tickets, right? <laughs> and like everyone is dying for a ticket, and no one knew where the ticket bo- booth was, and so I, I somehow find it, and I look, and for the 1030 slot, which is the only slot available for like the short 20-minute time period we had in there, and there were four tickets remaining. Mr. Lee and uh, his wife were ahead of me, and so they got two, and then Richard got one, and then I think I got like the next to last one or the, the last one. And so I was walking up, I was walking up the tower, and you can definitely feel like the drastic amount. Okay, so you did get to go. Oh yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it it was like crazy because. Like, you're walking on one side, and it feels like you're walking downhill, even. And you're walking <laughs> uphill, and it's crazy. Uh, same thing on the okay, way down. Okay, here's the thing. It didn't feel like it. You were. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. And when you get to the top, the view is just, gor- like, gorgeous of Pisa and, like, the fields and just everything. Like, the red tops. The mountains were. sun was shining nice for you, too, yeah? Yes. Yeah. It was, it was so, good. So, the Leaning Tower, of course, is the main attraction, and... For those of you who don't know, you know, they realized pretty quickly when they started building the first part of this. I mean, somebody looked at it and went, is that leaning? And so it took several centuries before they got people courageous enough to try to finish this already leaning thing. <laughs> and so every architect tried to fix it in their own way. And then eventually it got worse and worse and worse. But in the 1990s, they did a bunch of stuff. I mean, they, they tried pouring 16 tons of lead on one side to they try said to it was ugly it. it worked but it was ugly right <laughs> <laughs> but eventually they they figured out a system to suck out soil from underneath that side to drop down and it fixed it six inches which they believe is about what galileo saw when he was living in pisa and doing his experiments if oh. he actually did them off the tower like the myth is <laughs> or what the legend says but so <laughs> we're actually seeing the tower kind of like they saw it you know in the uh what 1500s so right. Early 16. 16, yeah. And to, to elaborate on Pisa, because obviously everyone talks about the tower, but the baptistry and cathedral were, were a sight. 
So you go in the baptistry, and every once in a while, they have this tradition I'd never heard of before, but they make everyone be quiet. There's a big sign that says, Silencio. And then uh, a guy comes out and does his best rendition of a Gregorian chant or something. Oh. And it was not the most pleasant to the ears, <laughs> but, but still, the echo yeah. was pretty cool. And then as far as the cathedral goes, you got one side. You got art everywhere, and the ceiling had gold. It was it was mahogany and gold, which was actually not a Renaissance uh, did, art. Did anybody get a chance to peek inside the cathedral there in uh, Bologna? Did you look inside? It, now, okay, so what I'm going to say here, just to reference, because you guys looked in the cathedral today, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were in a couple of different things, we saw small chapels and whatnot, when we go, is it tomorrow or is it the next day, we go, it's tomorrow, it's the next day, right, we go to yeah, Vatican, all that. when we go to St. Peter's, all of those will fit inside that. We might just have, have to have a special <laughs> it's on because y'all aren't ready. Yeah, you just, you don't know what you're about to see, you've seen some cool things so far, but when we go there... I promise you, you will be stunned. I do want to say real quick, when you were talking about the baptistry, the, there was a guy that works there, and they closed the doors. And supposedly, there's a 10-second echo that you can have. So there, he, he's hit, he hit three different notes. I don't know if you noticed, but he changed. <laughs> he was like Yeah, he, he wasn't hitting the same exact notes every time. But it still got, it gives you a sense of the, the acoustics of the baptistry because it is a round room. Uh, and then, of course, the cathedral is awesome to be in as well. Yeah, yeah. When he was when he was doing the little chant thing, I was like personally, I closed my eyes and I just like took in the echo because he wasn't like just on pitch, but it sounded so beautiful. And I was like, what if I was in here alone, just yelling? Like, how cool it would what sound? What would be so. awesome is to mm -hmm. have a choir or just just yeah. even like, two or three oh people. God. We were we were in uh, a couple years ago. We were in London and we were in Westminster Abbey, and they were doing prayers. They had just had the the uh, the bombing in. Uh, Belgium, I guess it was, and they were doing a special prayer for that, and the guy was, and it just, it reverberated through that building, and you could feel it go through you. It was really, yeah, those those things are so acoustically well designed, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. Go ahead. I think walking into the walking into the chapel at uh, I think Bologna, in Bologna. Uh, oh my gosh, no, no. The chapel or the choir. the chapel the, or the cathedral? The cathedral. Okay. Sorry, sorry, the cathedral. I want it, dude. No, Noah and I. I know me specifically. I wanted to break out in a, in a, in some choral song <laughs> so bad. I mean, <laughs> it it really is like like I I I like coughed and it like I could hear I I could hear it for the next I could hear it for the next like ten seconds. Uh, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, and they're designed. I mean, these buildings are designed in this way because there was no amplification system. Right. And you have to hear somebody. That's uh, you know a hundred yards on away a high altar. Yeah. So uh, you know th th that's why they have such great acoustics and uh, yeah. yeah. Some and these these churches are the most amazing churches in the world. Speaking of great acoustics, I think we've got some pretty nice things going on here, right? Can you hear? Yeah, yeah. I can. I can hear the reverberation of people. Uh, one of the other thing cool uh, cool things about the uh, baptistry was that uh, it took a while to complete. Get so it? the first half of it happens to have a no. the first half of it happens to have a. Uh, I forget the t exact type of art style, um, an older uh, art style, and I think it was more Greek or uh, more Roman. And the uh, second, uh, higher levels of it had a more uh, Gothic theme to it. Everything was more pointed and sharp, uh, as opposed to the uh, bottom being much more rounded. Um, yeah, and you're going to see that occasionally where they, they're going to mix a Romanesque style with the different yeah. earlier styles. I mean, because they, a lot of this stuff they're building on, and some, some, some cities are more confused than others mm -hmm. on their direction. Um, but, uh, you know, in Rome, you're going to get to see some really good examples. Let's bounce into Florence, though, because we don't want to. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So for time's sake, we got a few minutes left. Let's talk about Florence. Okay. I, wanna, I, wanna, I want a reaction when you saw the Duomo. For the first moment, I want to hear. I want to hear your thoughts on this. So yeah, uh, I pers I, I did not go to Pisa. I think I'm the only one in this group that didn't go to Pisa. Besides so Franklin, Franklin. Went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sta uh, right. Franklin stayed in Florence, and so um, we talked about it in Euro. Mm -hmm. And I saw pictures, but the moment I walked out of that alleyway <laughs> and looked up a little <laughs> bit to my left, I saw this unfathomable piece of architecture that. Again, like I can't even describe in words. Like, and you know, unfortunately, I wasn't a like we weren't able to climb up. And you know, Ian talking about the views that made me jealous, but we weren't able to climb up. But just looking at that, and I got—I mean, I, I circled around a couple times. Like, it is really 
really massive. The, the, the pink and the white and the green marble on the outside of the building, plus all the decorations, and then you add that dome on top. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, and it was a perfect day, too. Like, it was just absolutely yes. beautiful day. And then tonight, which before we left, we got to see it again, all lit up, you know. This, just this fading, deepening yeah. blue in the background. So for those that yeah. don't know, this is the Florence Cathedral. It's the largest brick dome in the world. Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi. Uh, I'm not pretty sure how to pronounce it. There's yeah. several B ones that uh, I keep. Yeah. He won a contest to do this thing, and it's never been done lot, quite like this. And he actually had to build two domes, and there's a lot to it. And he did it without scaffolding, they st- which the, is the, crazy. The cathedral itself stood for over 100 years without a dome because nobody knew how to, how to create a dome that wouldn't fall in on mm-hmm. itself. Yeah. In that bigger space, but the so, marble, the different color marble, the pink and the green that they have to haul in, it's it's really quite something. And if you you know, and I've, unfortunately we didn't have time to go up into the dome. I we got to I got to go. We got tickets though, with just enough time to go climb the uh, Joto Bell Tower next door, which is right beside it. Yeah, and it, I mean the the view from there was pretty good as well. Yeah, uh, I didn't get to do it last time we were here, but um, yeah, and it was golly, it was it was it's cool here. Like, we got some wind blowing. It's when I got to the top of that tower, it was cold, and it felt like remember Vesuvius? It was like that. Was like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. so yeah, so it was like icy wind, but it was it, it was nice. Four hundred something, four hundred nineteen steps, I think it was to the top. And then uh, you get back to the bottom and you look at me and go, yeah, I conquered that. Yeah. But just the, the idea that they could make the tower is just so straight up, you know. The, just the idea that you could build that and have it work. I don't know. I love engineering. I can't do it, but I'm fascinated by it, you know. I just those, uh, any, any of the architectural structures and the engineering goes behind it is just absolutely now, great. Cor- you know? so and correct me if I'm wrong. Especially at that time. Yeah, talking about the, the, the dome, the actual dome itself. Sure, yeah. yeah. There was a c- competition, and I don't know if it was the dome or the baptistry. But they were both. Both. Okay. So there was a competition to where, you know, so there was some devious plan involved that like got the. Gilberto uh, was the guy who was gonna. Actually, they were they were arguing. They were uh, competing for who was gonna do the doors. The doors. Right. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So okay. they won't. And they, uh, what we end up with is Gilberto's designs wins. Brunelleschi had had tried, but he he was rejected. So he's kind of miffed about that, right? A little salty. And the the because all these guys are competing for jobs, right? So they didn't really get along because of that. And he felt that he should have had the job. So anyway, like twenty something years later, when they're having the competition for the dome, they both go at it again. Unless he wins, but and this is something that I heard uh, Bill Remo say, and I didn't know this that um, they actually because <laughs> because uh, Gilberto had put his name in the hat too and had worked at it. He came in like a close second apparently, and they made him uh, Brunelleschi's assistant. And so he had to figure out a way to get out of that deal. He didn't want him to work in with him because he didn't like the guy. Is that where is that where you were going yeah, with that? Okay, yeah, go ahead and finish the story. Yeah. It, well, and then from there, I guess the assistant, like the assistant, yeah. he he was given the responsibility of creating, of like, of giving the design. But yeah. He didn't really know how to do it, right? He didn't understand he the didn't full understand. design, right? Yeah. So he gave it to the people who who, who were the contractors, basically. City elders, yeah. And they were like, "This is ridiculous. Like, this will never work." And they fired. Him. Yeah. It was a set. It was a setup. Yeah. Yeah, and then ha- you know, happy ending for. Uh, I learned today that Gaberti was inspired by the Pisa Cathedral doors oh. because they are very similar. Yeah, yeah, they sure are. Yeah. So, and we saw those today. So I, it was nice to see that those doors, and then come to see the replicas. Now the real doors are actually in the museum. Right. The the like, the the, the ones that are on the building today are replicas of the real ones that are stuck in a museum. Yeah. So there is a Duomo museum yeah. right across the street that you can go in and see a lot of the the major things. Um. All right, we have to move on now right, what, to... What else, what, hold on, what else stood out to you about Florence before we... Well, I'm going to move on to something else in Florence. Oh, you're doing... Okay, 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 sorry. All okay, right, go ahead. Bes- let's do the uh, the David, because we, we definitely uh, had to do that. And the Academia. Like, this is all we had time for, because really, for some of us, we only had about four hours in Florence, and we were waiting in lines and all that, so we didn't get to so many things. We didn't even get to see Santa Croce. Didn't get to see Santa Croce. I did get into the Uffizi because I didn't go to Pisa, so at least I got to do that, and I didn't get to do it last time, right. and that was awesome. But let's talk. Let's, yeah. Let's, let's, let's get your I wanna, Yeah, I want to hear student responses. Okay. Um, the academia, I, I'm a, I guess I kind of expected a little bit more, but then, like, the David was way, way more than I had expected. He had talked about whenever he saw it for, I guess, the first time, mm-hmm. you got emotional. Yeah. And, like, whenever I saw it, I just turned the corner because I'd just seen a bunch of stuff that, I mean, it was nice and all, but nothing that I really recognized. The, the David is the attraction. There's, yeah. there's other like, stuff there to kind of – I turned the corner, <laughs> and I, I literally just stopped, and I was like, like, we've just seen pictures of it in, like, Euro world, 
um, and I was just like blown away. And I, like this sounds so cliche, but I literally just stood there. I was like, wow, like I, I'm here right now <laughs> with this thing that like we just talked about, and just like getting up close to it. And yeah, and you can walk all the way around it, and you could, they let you take pictures. It's it's yeah. pretty impressive how how accessible it is. Now, there's a replica in the square, but it is nothing. You really have to go in inside. Did you see the one in the square as well? Okay, yeah, so going on one of the tours. Yeah. Um, but whenever you're in there, I feel like a lot of people didn't appreciate the fact that it was carved and not molded, because it, it, right. I mean, you would just think that like molding it would obviously be a lot easier, but carving it like where his hand touched his uh, like his thigh. Just that yeah. Uh, it's crazy that they had to like carve the hole out of that. And he's holding a rock too. And, like, right? His hand <laughs> like this. Is getting the realistic. Get, you gotta get that close to your face. Giving a little bit, like the curvature of the hand. Uh huh. Right there like at the, the wrist. Yeah. Like I, just can't even, I can't even imagine. So, so, so they, okay, so history. I I had told you this before because we talked we teach a little bit of art history in my Euro class. So when I when I told you the things right, mm-hmm. so how did it how did it compare? And I, I'm not saying, how, I'm not asking how good a job I did on describing it, but I mean, c- you had an image in your head obviously when you went in. It was, more, was it? Better than you thought it was going to be? It was more like I understood, like, your passion for it and that you liked it so much. And, like, I guess I had more, like, respected that. But then I really understood what you were saying when I saw it. You have to see it to know. Yeah. yeah. And it was his was unique. I mean, there's several Davids that have been done by several sculptors over the years. But Michelangelo made him a muscular man. Mm-hmm. And also it was before he fought Goliath. So right. he's, if you look at it, the neck him straining like he looks it's almost concerned. like you can see the adrenaline flowing through his like body he's yeah. not sure how this thing's about to go out, go down and you the emotion by the way this is just marble it was a big chunk of marble that most sculptors passed on because they didn't want to touch it they said it's too big can't do anything with it and he just he just attacks this thing and the emotion that comes out of that it's crazy when you think it's just a big rock <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah and uh, he ended up sculpting that um, his first try he had no practice with uh, he did um, we were told that he ended up going into a morgue um, and ended up cutting up bodies to uh, study their anatomy so that he could do... Which uh, was illegal at the time. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh, so he could better um, get this yeah, sculpture yeah, yeah, to, to look though. right. And then he ended up doing the uh, sculpture uh, basically in one shot. He never had any like wax uh, practice carvings uh, because... M- okay, so let's go ahead and just say it. Genius, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, wh- what's crazy about <laughs> M- Michelangelo is he, he's the greatest sculptor. We all know that. But then he got commissioned to do the Sistine Chapel, and he's not a painter. Yeah. And he ends up being probably, what, third greatest painter of all time? I mean, like, this guy was a he, – he wasn't a painter, yet he created that. And a, even Raphael, who's just a painter, goes in there and goes, wow. I mean, like, even the greatest painters in the world were blown away by a guy who was a sculptor. Yeah. Who decided to paint, which is insane. Um, I see. What else do we want to say about uh, the David or – Florence in general, anybody? Okay, uh, Florence. Um, there were a few sectors. There was a um, there was a political sector, a religious sector, and then there was like a Michelangelo's house, I believe. Mm. Or Dante's Dante's house. Yeah, Dante. Um, and um, his house had crumbled and um, ended up getting rebuilt. Uh, but the uh, what were they they. There was a, a famous family that ended up taking over Florence, or n- not Florence, uh, yeah, Florence, uh, the Medici's, mm-hmm. um, and they had a basically a walkway to their other palace that was on the other side of the city, yeah. going through uh, buildings <laughs> above the streets. How how rich are you if you can have people build a walkway for you from your work to your house, <laughs> so that you didn't have to? Well, you know, and and th- so some of that is like, it's like elitist. Obviously, but at the same time, there's I think there's a practicality to that too because they had to be they had to move efficiently and they had to move safely. They weren't I mean they were masters kings basically of this city, and there were people who wanted to assassinate them. You've all seen Assassin's Creed, like that's a thing, right? And so you had to be able to get away from people who might do things to you. So this elevated walkway, which by the way they didn't walk on, they that's were what I was gonna okay. Say, go ahead. Was say, yeah. is like, you know they're not walking across that; they're getting carried. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like gold throne kind of carried. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but it is a weird time in history when you have all these world famous artists and sculptors and all that in the same town 
I mean, when you think about the Florentine artists, they're all right there together, painting. And they knew each other and they competed with each other. Leonardo and and, uh, and Michelangelo didn't really care much for each other. Like they're very different people. S- that one's very social and active and and like, but Michelangelo is like brooding and s- l- almost a loner kind of guy. And they and again they're competing for jobs, so they just they had kind of a distaste for each other. Maybe that rivalry well, made them better yeah, in the end. No, did you? Ha- I, I was I was a while ago when we were talking about the the David statue. Did you have a reaction to it? I I was extremely impressed. I didn't. Surprisingly, I think it's because I saw it early. I didn't. It didn't like stop me in my tracks. But mm-hmm. once I got up to it, I saw these veins. I was like, whoa! Like, <laughs> I don't. I, I, it's just impossible for me to perceive how that, is, how you could create that. Like I couldn't do that in a lifetime. But what really got me, like, everyone talks about the David in there, but there's a lot of other stuff in that. Sure. Yeah. Museum, and and I really, I've always heard, oh, Renaissance art, it's all about emotion now, and I started looking at these paintings and like kind of kind of got me in my feels you know I started, <laughs> I started being emotional and like like all of these scenes you know I'm Catholic and all these scenes of Jesus coming down from the cross and all these incredibly like uh, important scenes for the religion and for me as a person and you're not just hit with one of them it's like one here and another there and another there and it's right. just walls and walls of them yeah and, and more like that actually got me more than David surprisingly yeah well hey that, 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 and that's legitimate too. Yeah, whatever it is, something's going to speak to you on this trip. It, yeah, it does, not everybody has the same reaction, obviously. But that, yeah, so you had that too. Like, there's the the one statue where they're all twisting together the three bodies, like the Sabian women one, right? It's all like twirled around. Okay, go ahead. I mean, kind of, bouncing off of kind of what Noah said is uh, to be able to, because you know, I see my emotion in the art as well. Uh, I like. I can kind of put myself in the shoes of the artist, not as far as like talent, because I'm obviously not as talented as them, but I can I can visualize their thought processes and I can visualize uh, what it means to them as an artist. And you know, you know, Noah and I were talking about it, and, and it's really interesting to see how the things I feel today about my religion, you know, was is exemplified in art that was made hundreds of years ago. It's in, in it's like it's kind of a nice reinforcement. Yeah. There's a exactly. there's a steadiness to it. There's a you know, it's it's anchored. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. And like like you said, I was just thinking like, the transcendence of of my religion now and then is like is backed up through So art. do you feel like you like a reinforcement? Yeah. Yeah. Wait wait till you see the Vatican. I'm telling you. Like when you when we go into St. Peter's. Okay, Ian. All right, so uh, going back to the David statue and mm-hmm. my reaction, I knew the David statue was going to be around the corner, so like my kind of thought process was like I didn't want to see it until it was like right in front of me. Okay. So I, I, I was Did you, <laughs> you kept your head down? In my head <laughs> until I was like. That's cool. Like probably 20 feet from it or so. And like I, I would see it out of the corner of my eyes, like this thing is going to be massive. And I, I just look up and I like, like it, it glows. It radiates. You've heard descriptions of it, but it is truly just amazing. Like you really do come around a corner, and it's there. Yeah, and, and, I, and sometimes you, you see these unfinished works by Michelangelo. You don't. So they catch your eye, and then all of a sudden yeah. you look up, and it's it's right there. Yeah. And you're like, oh wait, there it is. That's the real thing. Because is it is it the most famous sculpture in the world? Maybe. Maybe. Think of a more famous sculpture. Instantly I'll recognizable. I don't know. But. Okay, so you probably saw the most famous or maybe greatest sculpture yeah. in the world. Uh, we're going to see a bunch of other most famous, largest church, <laughs> large, large, <laughs> you know, all this stuff. And just like you did that, where you closed your eyes and then you looked up, here's what you need to do at the Sistine Chapel when we go here in yes. a couple days. You need to go in because you kind of go in the back. you gotta, you got to put your head down. Don't look up. Don't look at anything. You look at your feet. And it's, you walk and it's all the way back to the And you door. have to be perfectly silent in there too. They'll they'll silence us before we go in. It's completely hushed. You can't make noise. But what you'll hear when we go in and people start to do that, you look up, you'll hear people gasp. Yeah, there's a little door. Just a little bit you of just go go right to that door and then just turn around and then look up and you'll get the ceiling and the last judgment all in one view. Yeah. And that should be your first view. And then we're gonna get of course a reaction to that. So tomorrow we head out to Rome. We're going straight to Rome. We got several hours of free time tomorrow where we're just going to walk around the city. We're going to be look, they're going to see the Colosseum for the first time tomorrow. Then the very next day we do the Vatican, which is going to be, it's going to be maybe one of the highlights of the whole okay. thing. Okay, people so, on the podcast listening in, like you need to know, like everybody's smiling, like giant smiles. <laughs> this is, it's going to be so awesome. It day amped four, up. starting tomorrow.
Okay, so we are here with a special guest, our tour director, the man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> oh, good His name is Dario. So, Dario, tell ciao. us about yourself. <laughs> ciao, belli. First of all, ciao, belli. How are you? <laughs> this is our almost our last day here. Almost. After nine amazing days together, guys. So, you want me to talk about myself? Yes. Yeah, we. Okay. Right. See, so wha- you, you, s- you spend all this time learning about us, but we want to learn more about you. Okay. So let's start say not my age. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm from Rome, as you can hear. I'm Italian, as you can hear from my accent. And I'm from Rome. I was born and raised in Rome. And I'm 33 years old. And I do a tour director full time as a job. Uh, I used to work at my family restaurant. And I acted a lot in my life. So I've done a lot of stage performances and dancer and also singer. But now I don't have voice, so don't ask me to sing. <laughs> because this group was 130 people, so I shouted too much. I don't have any more voice. But yes. And last yeah. time we were here in 2015 with you, we ate at your family restaurant. Yes. And it was, it was like, great. yeah, 2015. Had like I had uh, a typical Italian restaurant in Rome, and it's called Ostaria. So every time you want to have a typical traditional experience, you have to go in an osteria. So the good thing, the first thing you need to know as osteria is different from a restaurant. Restaurant is more like classy, fancy one. Osteria is more local with uh, like this uh, paper, the table. So it's more rustic, it's more like basic, but the food is so authentic. So that, that was my family restaurant. And I worked there for like all my entire life. My mother was pregnant of me when they opened the restaurant. That's great. And they just sold it. They just they sold, sold it. Oh. That that means they have to work more as a tour director. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. So talk about that, like, because you you we s- we requested that you be our guy. Like we wanted so badly for you to, to because you did such a great job the first time we were with you. And I don't know what happened the second time, but this is. <laughs> 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 so yeah. So. Uh, but talk about how you got involved with uh, EF. Mm. Uh, I like this interview. <laughs> it makes me feel special. Well, <laughs> let's start. <Sure. laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, I was working at my family restaurant. So one day, one tour director came with this group of 15 years old people, and I started making fun, as you know me guys for that, right? I started to make jokes or to play around. And he said, oh, you should become a tour director. And I said, absolutely not, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like, I'm like, I was <laughs> a disorganized person. I didn't want to plan anything. I'm, I was the kind of artist, right? No, no, no timing at all. But he insisted several times, and I said several times, no. He called me back and said, so, no, I'm not interested. <laughs> and then I decided to do the interview, and it was good. Mm-hmm. And uh, they hired me. So 2014, and so I. Yeah. So wh- what was the interview like? Was it? Actually, my interview, I just did as I usually do, uh, being me. Yeah. <laughs> and in, in, in this interview were um, uh, people from America, so from the office of uh, uh, Boston. And uh, well, they asked us several, several things to do, such as, uh, I don't know, we are in a big open space in a restaurant. You, in the interview, you should stand up and tell the people uh, what we're going to have uh, as dinner or a lunch. And I made a mistake that time because I was so stressed out. So it was like, there was like, you have to think, 2,100 uh, people that wanted to become two directors. So I said, okay, go to the kitchen and ask well, what is for food tonight. Okay, I asked it and they told me uh, these things that is called pure in, uh, in, um, in, in, in Italiano, which means mashed potatoes, right? But I didn't know how to say this in English. So I asked someone, excuse me, how can I say this in English very fast? Because I don't know the word. I don't want to make like a mistake. OK, it's called mashed potatoes. So I said, OK, guys, so excuse me, may I have a special? We have pasta with tomato sauce. Then we're going to have chicken as second course, and then smashing potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone was like, what did I say? <laughs> oh, smashing potatoes. We like this thing. <laughs> we like this joke. <laughs> and that's why I was starting to be famous, because of my thing. <laughs> And you've been with them since 2014. 2014. Okay, can you ballpark? Uh, well you might not know what that word means. Estimate. Uh, okay. How many tours have you been on? How many tours have you led? Can okay. You guess? Uh, I've done with four tours the first year, six, the second, always growing. Uh, I think 30 tours. 30 oh tours. Wow. Yeah, 30, maybe a little bit more. 30, 33. Mostly Americans, I assume? American, but I do also with French Canadians. Okay. Yes. 
it's so. it's different yeah i love you america more Shh, don't say that <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. it's i work a lot with uh, college break students too actually it's always the same brand because ef company has like these uh, several branches and one covers a college break so to the people from 18 to 29 years old and they don't know each other they're more like funny people <laughs> Yeah, better than both. So, Hi. <laughs> so you'd say you do about one tour every two months? One tour, well, the, the tour season starts from March till the end of September. And uh, yeah, I cover this period, this the peak, the high season too. So we do have Torin Davis, a student, a senior. And I want to ask him, because this is kind of getting close to the end. Talk about your uh, so far. Talk about talk about Daria. No, <laughs> talk <laughs> about your <laughs> overall experience. What do you think about these tours? And like, is this your first EF tour you've ever been on? This is. All right. So what do you th what do you think so far? I mean, we still got another day. Let's so. let's start that back. What did you expect, mm -hmm. and how has that met? Yeah. Well, it started with um, I was wanting to sign up all the first semester of my senior year, but my parents said that um, they couldn't afford it until I got. Um, a 32 on the ACT, which is what I needed because because at U of A that made uh, or gave me more scholarship money automatically, <clears throat> and they said that if I got a 32, then I could go, and I got a 32 on my last possible test for U of A, which was in December. So I had to sign up late, and then someone dropped out of the um, going on the trip, which opened up a spot for me. So it just worked out perfectly. Yeah, um, yeah, somebody did drop out right when you signed up. Which just worked out perfect, and I was so happy to be able to do it because I knew this would be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity um, just to be able to go with kids my own age, just a big group like this, and my teachers, like most importantly, uh, who could like tell me stuff. Like I've been talking to you all the whole time, yeah. uh, learning stuff, and I just knew that this was something that I didn't want to pass up if I could help it. Right. Um, and so I had very high expectations coming into it, and I have been anything but disappointed with it. Right. Like what's, your, what's your favorite thing? If you, if you could narrow it down to one. Um, I, I, that's, that's tough to pinpoint. Sistine Chapel was breathtaking. David was breathtaking. Um, city itself, just Venice, was just amazing. Just crazy to think about a whole city that doesn't have any roads for cars or anything. <laughs> yeah, like that's just something to admire. Um, so I, I can't pinpoint anything like what I've been talking about with some of the kids. We were one night we were talking about stuff we'd done that day, and we we're like, that was yesterday, maybe even the day before. Mm -hmm. It was that morning. Just the days just are so long because we do so much each day. There's not any moment where you're just bored because yeah. you're always learning something or doing something, and I, I don't think I could say that about any other vacation I have gone on or could have gone on. Yeah. It helps also to have a good understanding of history. Like you've taken all, basically, I, all, tons of the AP history. All of them class. except for world. Yeah, so you knew coming in a lot of the stuff you were going to see. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always tell the kids, research before you come so it'll mean more. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that does, because I remember the first time I came, you know, I was a history teacher. I was 26 or so before I came for the first time, and I was blown away like you were. So, Torin, what do you think about Dario? Oh, How man. How important is it to have a tour director? Because I tell the kids, like, you're going to have this guy or girl. I've had both uh, in different parts of the world. But I had Dario two years ago, and I remember I requested. We can request sometimes if we have somebody we like. And I said, that's who I want. And we got him. I was so excited because I thought Mr. Remo was going to steal him somehow because <laughs> he's been doing it for so much oh. longer. But when we got him, but like, for me as a group leader, I couldn't do this. I couldn't do this. I mean, and I've been to the Italy several times, but I don't, I don't know Italian. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, like, I tell the kids, like, if you and your family came, not only would it cost twice as much, but just the organization of all the stuff you'd have to see and getting from one place to another and hotels and flights and it w and you do all that for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so how, how important have you found the tour director or just the, how, how do you find, like, the organization of this tour? Well, um, to answer the first part of the question, Dario specifically, I can't get enough of him. Every I, I, every time I see him, I'm like, ciao bello. Ciao bello. <laughs> every time. Wakey. Wakey. 
Um, but yeah. Andiamo. Uh, I'm I'm genuinely gonna miss Dario. He's been he's made this trip even better, just because he knows any question the answer to any question I can ask him. And I mean I can see the stress I'm in it through like other tour directors, but Dario just seems so confident and sure in everything that we do that it, he seems like he has everything under control when all the students are just doing everything they're being told. We have no idea really what we're doing. Um, but props to Dario. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, as you know, and in history shows this, your leader has to remain calm. Mm -hmm. If the leader starts getting crazy and stressed out, it makes everybody else go, oh, something's wrong. And so his, at his calmness, I think, is really, that's what I try to do in my classroom or where, whatever I'm doing. I don't freak out, you know, and, and I think that helps kind of keep the whole group kind of mellow and on a pretty good... Uh, Unless, you know, his phone goes off every five minutes. <laughs> <No. laughs> <laughs> so uh, what else? What else? What other questions do we have for Dario it's while like he's here? I, I, I want to add a thing. It's like uh, the thing is that when you feel that uh, the students notice that you trust them, right, they become more responsible in general. Because if you put them fear in general or you're stressed out or you look like you don't trust them, then things, bad things happen. But... I'm more, I rely on them. I always say, that you're responsible, I trust you, and they become more responsible, no? Both in college break tours, when you have like adults that they do what they want, and both also for students, and it worked. I think the um, one thing I want to say that is, I really believe that they put efforts for doing, for affording these tours, that it's sometimes a lifetime experience for, for them. It's important because the family do sacrifices to uh, let the students, their children go to this tour. So I respect the family, what's behind it. I try to do my best because I feel like I need to put everything 100% because they deserve it. Uh, the family did, I mean, work hard also for uh, giving their children this chance to go abroad. So for me, it's like a must. I do whatever I can do to make them happy. And if uh, the result is like, if, if they are happy, I'm, I'm happy too. It's, it's like a, an exchange of energy, right? So. Because sometimes people say, you're not tired of all these things that happen daily with all the things that you have to think. I say, I'm tired, but at the same time, when as my came uh, come back to me, I'm so happy. I mean, when I see in the students' eyes the joy of things they've never seen before, the, they're so happy that I'm happy too, and I'm happy and proud to do this job, right? Yeah. The, the, the one number one reason that I requested you was because you genuinely cared about the kids. And not only cared about the kids, you wanted to get to know them. And like, you went above and beyond, especially I, I'll remember when we were going through the forum, because I've had other tour directors that when you, when you do that long tour, you might not see them. And we got through with the forum tour one time and there was nobody around. And of course, I'm just as scared as the kids. <laughs> like, what do we do now? I don't know. But you kind of, you're always there waiting on us, you know, and, and also you would go out of your way to talk to the kids individually. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't just you were leading the tour you would drop back and, and you talk to the kids, like one-on-one, -on -one, and you would play around with them and stuff. And I think that's the most important thing for a tour director is that you get to know the kids and you, you, know, you have a relationship. It's, it's so brief. Do, do you think that your background in entertainment has helped you be a better director too? He helped me, but beside that, it's like I have a lot of passions and this job gives me a lot of passions, right? Mm -hmm. I mean... When I feel things, I'm more excited to do and to cover even more things, right? Because I feel when I feel happiness, when I feel enthusiasm, when I feel curiosity in general about things, I'm so open to answer all the questions. I'm so open to their needs, right? So I think theater helped me to understand better human being in general and to maybe shape what I want to say according to the person I have in front of me, mm -hmm. right? Because since I studied a lot of theater, so when you study theater, you study a lot of psychology a little bit. So human being and all the interaction and the personality. So I feel like, yeah, I'm very uh, empathetic, how you say that? Mm -hmm. So right. it's like uh, I try to let the person believe that is unique in the moment that he speaks to me. Because I really want him to feel unique. And all the things that he has to ask me are important because those are important, because the question that they are asking today are the question that we were asking in the past, right? So it's always important, even if 
a question that comes like, uh, I don't know from where, but it's important because you're asking me. So it's important to give them this kind of importance every time. Here's what it kind of strikes me. You're like the job title is tour director, but you're a teacher too. I'm a teacher. Right? You're a teacher. You're a professor. <laughs> uh, you, you're teaching us about your culture and about your history and about your city mm. and about your family and all of that comes across and I think that the, the best teachers I've ever had mm. do that mm. right and I Thank can you. all we I just I think that we try to a teacher <laughs> it's part of it no I think I, but but bravo I mean I think that's mm. I think you do a great job thank you I am like an observer no so I haven't studied this but I observed a lot and so as soon as I was curious that's why curiosity is very important for you you have to keep high curiosity in all things I was very curious when I was 15 16 at your age so I always asked questions about everything I was annoying sometimes <laughs> like you know what go go okay okay but very politely excuse me can you please <laughs> answer me this question so I, st I started to do my researches and I yeah I was I was I had a lot of passion. I was full of life. I'm still full of life because this is, uh, for us, is important. You're alive. So I think that I will keep on doing this job as soon as I'm alive to do this job, right? If one day I wake up and I don't feel anything, I will stop. But as soon as I feel this feeling for the students, for everybody, I keep on doing that. I'm, I'm so happy to do it. For me, it's not a job. It's like uh, sharing uh, a great experience with some people that become friends for a short period of time. This is like a kind of miracle because it, it, it never happened like this. This is like the magical of, of a journey, a short journey. That's why I, I love this job. It's I almost like the job came looking for you. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, it, fa it found you instead of you uh, finding it. Maybe it saved me from it the theater's me. performance. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, I w would have been on the stage like doing I don't know what. <laughs> is, there, is there a favorite moment or a favorite part of the tour that you really look forward to each time? Um, more than favorite places are the moment, the good quality time that I share with them. I, I like to talk on the bus and sharing like yeah. gestures and sharing like things, uh, anecdotes of my life. Yes. And seeing their reaction to what they've just, because I know you do that. We get back on the bus. What do you see? What do you like? Right? Yes. I, yeah. see, I, li I mean, I like to see, I, l I like when they come back to me and they notice something that they change their point of view, right? When, when I like when they open their mind and say, oh my God, I noticed these things I've never noticed before. I'm so overwhelmed. I want to know more. I, I like this exchange. That's why I try to push them to, to talk, to observe, to absorb what they see. To, and when you observe without judging you, you expand yourself, you spread your knowledge, because if you judge things, you kind of close-minded, but if you avoid judging and you observe the reality as it is, then you become a better person. And that's why, that's what I think I did in the past. It's hard, because of course, uh, it's easy to judge situation, right? So it's hard to slowly, slowly understand that it's important to not judging all kinds of situation from people to a, s a situation or an event. But when you do these, when you observe the reality as it is, you you really feel like you are more sensitive to the thi things that happen in life, and you're more willing to understand the other person, right? That's what I think, with no judgment. So this is important. This, that this is what I learned during my uh, travels journey before doing this tour. I started to travel at from 13 years old till 17 before going to university. And more and more, I stop charging, I spread my knowledge, and that's why I always tell them, travel, travel a lot, tra travel as much as you can. If you can, this is a gift that will you will keep forever. So this is my advice. Always keep on traveling, always uh, be enthusiastic of things in life, and uh, this is important. All I don't think there's thing. any better selling pitch for parents than <laughs> that, <laughs> to have their kids travel and experience other cultures and other everything, you know, because it does give you a, a broader perspective on life. Well, we, we came here, Kevin had asked me to come on this trips before, and we hadn't been able to work it out, but the first time that we came, and we met you, and we had all these experiences, and I, we, we, I, we came home with a piece of Italy, and you as a family member in our heart, 
And so I, we were determined to, to keep doing this as often as we can. So, again, I just wanted to make sure that I gave you credit for that because you, you made that trip extra special for us. Grazie. And you made this trip special for me, too. Well, a good way to end this podcast is something I'd like to know. How do you say history after hours in Italian? For the history after hours. Yeah, can you, can you translate that? Okay. Uh, storie dopo ore. That sounds a lot better than <laughs> We're going to change Storie the dopo name. Ore. <laughs> One more time. Uh, Storie. Storie. Dopo. Dopo. Ore. Ore. And there you have it. <laughs> All right. We will see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ciao, belli. Okay. So this is the last night in Rome. We are recording this podcast to reflect on our trip here in uh, Italy. Uh, up and down, all around. So we've there's been a lot of uh, things we haven't talked about. So first of all, let's just focus on what we saw in Rome. Right. As far as, w- you know, when we first got in there, we saw the Colosseum. That was the main thing and went through the Roman Forum. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of other things we saw. And then, of course, Vatican City. So let's start there. And you guys tell me what you think about. Well, I mean, for some of you, it's the first time you've seen any of this. So yeah. right. give me give me first impressions here. Yeah, no, you go ahead. Yeah, it's all, it's uh, all about you. Okay, well, my name is Matt Mayan. Um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, so first, first thing we did was first big thing we did was Colosseum, right? Um, which, again, you know, common theme, common theme through this trip has been you see it in the textbooks, and then you see it, you, you, like you're taught about it all, the, like you're taught about it, you know, th- for years and years, and then you finally see it for the first time, and it's like nothing you'd ever imagined. All right, so standing out front of it, like. Uh, again, we could talk about like how it looked and that, but I'm talking about like how did it sort of f- did it feel different than you thought it would? Oh yeah, oh definitely. Yeah. And I know, like, because you hear again, it's it's that thing where you just like you you hear these stories, and like words really, words really just like can't can't describe. Mm-hmm. And it's it's not that. I mean, it's not that it swept me off my feet. Yeah. But it was just it was a very unexpected feeling. Yeah. Just to see, just to hear, like the, the stories of people and the uh, and like kind of what what happened. Like, to me, it's like just just the ago. thought of standing in a two thousand year old structure. Yeah, exactly. And there's quite a bit of it left. I mean, it's it's obviously the whole of what yeah. it was before. You know, the glorious yeah. aspect of it's gone, but still, there's a weird sort of essence to it. Still, mm-hmm. you know, like historically, it's just like it's very moving. Yeah, you know. Yeah, go ahead, Tor. Um, I like what he was saying, kind of like on a personal like level of experiencing it you have to like the whole time i was in there i was just imagining like what it was whenever that like it was the hub of activity and just imagining people filling that with the marvel that was <coughs> in there like how beautiful that would have been and whenever you really think about that which it wasn't hard to do like it was easy to just see you could just see people going through there and that just being the place where everyone came just from Around, I mean, probably the world. Just to were you were you guys thinking about the bread and circuses thing we talked I about? I thought about that phrase yeah. so many times because I was like, if if there's some problems, you can probably come in here and be entertained pretty easily. Yeah. <laughs> the building itself, it's a weird contrast because when I st- I had this thought this year, where the descriptions of the building and the marble and the flags and the banners and the statuary and the gold and and you know the roar of the crowd and we think about modern stadiums and how cool it is to be if you've ever been inside one, and then to have take that beauty architectural design and all that and then watch think about the carnage that went on down below for entertainment for the masses and, and what's and what's weird is even though it seems like ah, we're i don't think that we're that far removed from that sort of you know <laughs> that sort of entertainment yeah we, so uh, but thoughts on it though um i thought i'm really intrigued by historical firsts i think i made this uh remark to, to mr pomfrey but I, I thought it was pretty uh pretty cool that this is what we base everything off of pretty much like this is this is the one you know Mm -hmm. this is the stadium this is the coliseum and like every football stadium i've been been to has the same design yeah the same premise and it was meant to impress and it does right even today and the effect still it's still effective to millennia later all right let's switch gears and talk about um vatican then sistine chapel yeah either any of you that's okay favorite thing though is the pieta (laughs) <laughs> it, I got emotional. I'm not proud of it. <laughs> but I Mich- got really Michelangelo statue. Like I don't know that, Like how can you carve that emotion into stone? 
I, I don't understand it, but it's it's beautiful, and it's, it's tragically beautiful. Yeah, right. I, I mean, it's if you if you strip away the religious context and you just mm-hmm. think about it from as a mother holding her son, I mean that's emotional. No, and then no for, mother should have to see that. Yeah, and then for that's Christians that. specifically it's to add the religious it. element back on, it just adds to the weight of it. And to think that it's just a piece of stone, but it's so much more than that, you know. Right. Well, like what I had said about the drapery on uh, Moses. It's, it's you have to keep in mind that this wasn't like um they didn't mold this they sculpted it and it's crazy that they could get the drapery that was like going down on what she was wearing and what uh, Moses had and like when he was pulling his beard it, it's crazy that you can imagine that and then sculpt hard stone and make it look like actual cloth like that's that's something that you have to keep in mind just it just makes me even more genius so. Did you have an emotional response to it? I mean, I, w- I just kind of sat there in awe, just <laughs> trying to understand how it happened. But, I mean, emotional, I would probably say not so much, but it, w- it was just, it just blew my mind. There are several versions of the Pieta. It's my favorite sculpture. But there's so, even Michelangelo did other versions. And you can see one at St. Paul's Cathedral in London, but this is the only one, in my opinion, that matters. And the what makes it is two things for me the if you look at mary's dress the way it it looks like it's flowing in the wind that's one big thing that's different but most of it is her face looking down at her son who just died and the way she's holding him and looking down the other pietas has her looking up towards heaven has a different expression but hers just somber sadness like a human emotion You know, she's not untouchable. She just lost her son. And you see a, you know, just a human that's hurting. And that that's impressive. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to comment on. Like you, a lot of these, a lot of the, you know, Renaissance art and things like that, that we see in these, you know, massive, beautiful, you know, cathedrals and basilicas and like, they're very, they, they touch on the supernatural side of, you know, creation and the gospel and, and, and that kind of thing. And, and you see like, many things that are, that are kind of romanticized almost. And when, when we first looked at the, like the Pieta, you, you, like you said, it was very humanized. It was very like down to earth, just I, I something that I could relate, relate to, you know? And I don't know if y'all felt that, but like I felt the sorrow from Mary. And I felt that, like, I could feel that. Well, let's back up real quick, because that's in St. Peter's Basilica, which we can get to. Let's go to the main attraction of Vatican City, the thing that kind of separates. I mean, there's no chapel like the Sistine Chapel. So you guys, all of you, first time, we have a bunch of students here. I don't know if Franklin mentioned that, but uh, uh, I guess this is the first time. Tell me your reactions when you saw... The ceiling, the Last Judgment. Ha- walk me through what you. Well, a lot of it was the build up because uh, we had a really good tour guide, in my opinion. He was he was great because first of all, I could understand him completely, and he he made some good jokes. But it was like this hype, you know. Like I thought he was just going to take us right to the Sistine Chapel. Instead, it, we went on about an hour, an hour and a half tour. He was just teasing us. He was just messing with us, and then he finally leads us in there. And I did the thing where you you look down, and then you go to the you go to the front because you kind of come in like the back corner, and you're right by the blue wall. So I like looked down. It was like I was like, oh, I don't want to look. And I think Ian was doing it too. And I looked up and I had that. I had the wow moment. It was it was awesome. It was awesome. And especially I noticed there's the corner. Uh, they touched it up in was the 80s. 80s. And there was a corner that they left uh, untouched because they wanted to show the contrast. There were two corners. It was like yeah. uh, two corners, right? It was like black. So I'm I'm glad they did yeah, that. Catholic <laughs> Church they, they use a lot of smoke and stuff mm-hmm. in their services. And it's so a incense. <laughs> you know, it, it gets so I'm sure it was pretty dull, still magnificent. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, I think if we just took you to Rome and just that was the first thing you saw, if we could blindfold you off the bus from Little Rock, Let's Arkansas, put <laughs> and we put you right in the middle of Sistine Chapel and said, "Look up," I bet you'd pass out <laughs> because we kind of desensitize you from mm-hmm. Venice. To Florence, you see amazing things. Oh, you, you went to Padua and saw uh, whatever. similar. <laughs> so it wasn't probably quite as shocking. But when you think back on it, 
when you're at Hot Springs, Arkansas, and you think back at what you saw. Oh, uh, I'm, this trip is designed for two weeks later. Mm, absolutely. Two weeks, think about what you did, and you're going to be itching to travel with you. Mm. I thought about Raphael walking in there. Because you know his his school of his school of Athens was you know right down the hall, and then he walks in there he's like, "Whoa, you're the best!" And so he paints him in there. <laughs> I thought that was really awesome. S- speaking of Raphael, I, I really w- was interested in uh, talking about the school of Athens because I had totally forgotten that it was uh, in there. And then we're in the room right before it. I'm like, "Wait, we're gonna see the school of Athens it? here pretty soon." And I walk in there and look, and I'm like, "Oh my god!" It's not like, by itself either. It's like no, part of the yeah. All the walls were decorated. I was like right before I walked in here, like I, I was just thinking about this, and it, I mean it was crazy just looking at all the different figures that we've talked about in there, like spotting Raphael, spotting um, Michelangelo. It was uh, Michelangelo is an interesting figure when you think about he was a sculptor by trade, and he just started painting, and he's probably in the top three best painters in the world. Oh my gosh! And then he decides to dabble into architecture, so he decides to create one of the most beautiful and largest cathedrals in the world. You know, this is just a guy. He's mad. He's just a genius. <laughs> I mean, even Raphael, who all he devoted his life to just painting, popped his head in there while, oh, wow, he just started something brand new that's post-Renaissance that I can't wrap my head around. So he's better than me, and that's all I do is paint. <laughs> and he was already a world-famous sculptor. So Gosh. I, yeah. And he, did, he worked quickly. The, at the, the time it took Michelangelo to do the whole ceiling, it took da Vinci that long just to do the Last Supper. <laughs> Four years. <laughs> so he works fast. Mm. Gosh, it's insane. So let's take, uh, what, about, what, what did you think about St. Peter's Basilica? I mean, what's your, we walked through that. We saw the Piazza first. And then as you walked around, what was your, I mean, just take it all in. Tell me what you thought. Um, I was talking to Mr. Franklin about this after, after the fact. And um, that, it really stuck with me whenever he said uh, that we were that close to uh, the remains of someone Saint, who Saint Peter wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who knew, who knew Jesus? Like I didn't realize that until he told me that. But thinking about that, it was just like, on this the close connection was was definitely real. This is separate from from Peter's chains, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, well, Saint Peter's Basilica. Uh, I I cliche, but indescribable <laughs> it's enormous yeah. it, like okay so think about this mm. it it's, it kind of has to be what it is right it's it's the christian church in the place really where the where the institution of christianity was founded right and so yeah for billions of people over the place. so it's it sort of the magnitude of it has to sort of match not just the institutional magnitude but the idea that it's the focal point for the faith mm-hmm. to, to echo the power and the magnificence of God himself. That's what that really is intended to do. And it's, and it's humbling. I'm a, that's oh the only thing gosh. that I could really, I walked in and I just, you, I just felt small, but not insignificant. Does that make sense? You're yes. Part of, yeah. You're part of the whole yeah. Yeah. It's cool. And to think about the history, just walking through there and the brilliance of the entire thing, cause it's still just, it's beautiful. Right. And, and it doesn't really matter. I've, I've had kids in the past who were like, well, you know, well, what if I'm not Catholic? doesn't matter. I mean, oh. It doesn't really matter what your faith yeah. is. The building is beautiful and, imp- and impressive. And I think you, know, you have an attachment to yeah. and that kind of aesthetic. And I, like, I, I'm not Catholic, but I, do, I did feel, and, and what you were saying was, I, I totally relate to, is when I walked in there, I felt so small, yet I felt like, even especially in this political climate and all the, all the division, like, I just felt like I belonged more than more than more than I've ever felt. I like it's interesting you say that because the Catholic Church, generally speaking, has been very accepting. Yeah, like they accept. That's what they do. Yeah. And if you look at the Bernini, you know, design the square and those arms basically that reach out from St. Peter's, the columns on each side that are like hugging the world. It it is accepting. Mm-hmm. You know, with yeah. of course you got the obelisk in the middle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's Egyptian obelisk. <laughs> but you know, what I kept thinking about when we were in there was. If we had aliens come down to Earth, th- it, that seemed like one of the just given places that they would take them. Just Took because it, 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 it would just help them. It would help them so much to understand 
Just just being in there and witnessing that just shows all of the. You can you just can kind of see how, why how influential ca- like can, Christianity and Catholicism has been. Yeah, I was like, oh, okay, this makes sense why all these, like like so many people like have this faith. You know, like you can think about it because it's it's emotional and it, it all like it just makes sense. It's crazy. And then I also like the couple details. Uh, Mr. Franklin told me like we were looking up and there's some random letters on the wall. I was like, oh, I mean, they're not, you know, they're just kind of far away. And then he said, uh, by the way, they're nine feet tall. I was like, oh, that little, that little speck over there. It's like, yeah, I wouldn't even like be as tall as that. And and by the way, I was kind of curious about this. How were these these dead popes from centuries ago? There's one uh, whose body was perfectly preserved. Right. How, how did that happen? Does anybody know yeah, how that happened? Know. The one that was perfectly not preserved was all, has, I think, has only been dead for about a hundred years. Yeah, still, but, but, that's but that's still, yeah, still, still, kind of embalming. You would think that, that I would don't be. know. So yeah, I mean, it's the, the church considers it a miracle, obviously. I don't. I so don't know. I mean, it's, everybody has to sort of you know come up with their own conclusions. I, don't that's, know. I mean, you can follow their conclusion, come up with your own. There, there, there are other ones that are closer one. to being skeletons in there. And yeah, it's that that kind of weird though, right? Yeah, it's like whoa. Part of what I saw too is that sometimes when we you know we teach history and we teach about the history of the institutionalized church and its power source and the money that they that they had and the and the influence that they had based on that. Sometimes we get caught up in that mm-hmm. story, and sometimes they became obstacles to progress. Right, and that kind of stuff. the corruption side. But, again, that what we always have to kind of check and balance ourselves on is that the idea of the church itself is founded on a faith that is welcoming and, and encompassing and trying to help as many right. people as it possibly can. And I think that ultimately, in spite of some of the n- negative issues that have happened with some of the poor leadership at mm-hmm. times, um, that, that that ultimate mission hasn't faltered. You know, and I think that, even that today, I think it feels m- more important for us to, to say those things, kind of like you were saying, Matt, the idea that sometimes there's so much division, particularly in the United States, we see our political system, right? Like, to, to find something that can bring more people together, as, any, as, a, as a community, together, I think it's a positive force. Okay, so that's Rome. And I mean, we could talk for another, you know, hour just about Rome. But let's now, let's move south. So we leave Rome, and we start driving. And we go to a place called Pompeii, which everybody's heard of, I assume, most of their lives. Maybe you don't know the exact story, but if you don't know the story, around 79 AD, there was a volcano called Vesuvius. It erupted. Most of the people got out. About 2,000 stayed, and they got immediately covered in this lava and then ash, which basically froze them in time and then eventually was uncovered. And it's the most complete ancient city of Rome that we have in the world. So we, we take the tour of what it l- literally, frescoes, road maps. I mean, literally the city is preserved. And I, I don't think that was impressed. I, I, I wish they would impress that upon people more, that you're not just going through ancient ruins like you did in the Roman Forum. It's, it's you're literally walking inside, through the yeah. city. Right, you can imagine, it wouldn't take much imagination to see what that city actually looked like. That's what I was um, kind of hinting at at the Colosseum, but it, it applies here too. Like whenever they were talking about the doors, um, how you can tell the, the different doors, how the shops slide and stuff, like it was easy to see just like someone opening that door and going in there, or like opening the door to their house, going in there, and there people riding on, riding on chariots through the streets. like. Yeah, more what you said. It doesn't take much imagination to see that, and whenever you see that, it just it puts it in a whole, whole different perspective than just seeing ruins. I mean, it's not exactly like walking through the Roman Forum, you know. It's it's different because yeah. because you're not you're not walking through like like a little piece of stone here and like a rock over here, and like you kind of have to like put bits and pieces together. It's like it's a whole, you know. It wouldn't take as much, nearly as much, to put that back in its original form. Really, if some of those things, you just put a roof on them, mm-hmm. and they're ready Absolutely. to go, right, in, in Pompeii. And then you have some people walking around, <laughs> and that's yeah. about it. Yeah, you could, I mean, you can definitely envision the city much more clearly. So. Yeah, the bathhouses, I mean, they're, they're complete, pretty much. There's a roof, there's windows, there's, I mean, you... The face of Poseidon carved into the wall. Yeah, you see the face, and you see frescoes. I mean, and, and there's still color, because they're frescoes, and they're going to last a long time. I, I think that's an interesting thing to do temples everywhere too but um so after pompeii i forced everybody to do this extension pompeii was part of the extension but we didn't have to do that but that's not really i did the extension for capri 
and for this whole area in the south. But um, because we're in Rome again, I just pointed around like in this area that we're in. No, the, talk about the south uh, of Italy. Talk about Naples. Take a, Sorrento. What did you think? Capri, whatever. It was just beautiful. It was like it was absolutely stunning. Like I wish I could live here or not here because we're in Rome once again. But <laughs> in Capri, we I were just there this morning, though. I know it's kind of weird to think about. We didn't get to spend any time in Naples. We kind of like got off the ferry, which that was a great ferry ride, by the way. And then we got on the bus and left. But I, it was just beautiful. Like you can't you can't really put it into words. It's a good way to end this trip to have a day where you're not just chasing in museums and you're not just trying to find one thing after another. You actually can just look and you don't have to think. It's just nature. And it reminded me a lot of like the Pacific Coast. Um, like just like how it was rocky and it just went straight up out of the water and just like boulders. It, like you can just look out in the water and there's boulders. Like we drove through one of those today mm-hmm. in the boat. Um, and so I kind of made that connection. But it's, it's just, it's not anything that you would expect to see in Italy. I don't know. We, we just always, we don't hear about Capri, about like <coughs> all those rock structures. So it was a, Great surprise to end the trip, no doubt. Yeah, I spent a lot of time reflecting uh, today. Uh, after Capri, just like I mean, like you said, Capri was just so stunning. I'm probably, I mean, easily one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Um, but I mean, we got on that ferry and we took that you know f- three four hour bus ride. I mean, spent a lot of time just 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 doing some thinking, doing like doing uh, some reflection. Pumphrey and I were talking while we were up there at the top of the. Uh, at, at Augustus's garden, and he said, "It name off the the top s- views that you've ever had." And really, I think well, I mean we've and you've traveled quite a bit, you know. And and, and I have uh, my family and I have too. But I think maybe that view from the top of that uh, island may be it. That may be the best. Yeah, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. I mean, I've I've been to Jamaica and Cancun and places like that, and that's all beach, you know, like Florida. But there's something about those cliffs i saw we saw goat we saw a mountain goat yeah, we saw, we saw a little, we saw okay a here's goat. here's a little so this is my third time in capri and uh the first time i went i saw goats okay i thought no big deal i guess there's goats everywhere um the second time i didn't today when we went this morning the lady said she's been working there for 21 years and she's only seen goats four times i've been there three times in my life two out of three times i've seen goats it's got to be right, but then I talked to her later, and she she looked at me like she was really surprised. So I don't know how common mountain goats are on those cliffs, but I've seen them, you know, most of the time I've been to Capri. <laughs> but yeah, we we I thought the end we were on a big ferry that took us around and pulled us right up to these grottos. Oh my gosh! How savage was the captain of that ship oh, to get us oh, like? Just a okay. baller, no. absolutely. <laughs> Absolute hobby. Me, me and Jonah were at the front. There was only probably a handful, like eight people like, at the front. Everyone was at the back. And we, got and we, we were up there, and I was like, Jonah, like, I'm not, like, does this guy need like a signal? And, <laughs> no, I, like, you can ask him. I was opening the door, going back inside to go to the back of the, like, the boat because I couldn't take it. And then he finally hit it in reverse and stopped, literally within oh. three feet. Yeah, three feet. <laughs> you got one on the top? No, we were in the very front. Uh, we, okay, on the top, they have this big thing sticking yeah, out. Yeah, that got within inches of the cliff. <laughs> and then I've realized, okay, this guy does this every day. <laughs> I know. Oh, he's, a, he's one hand on the wheel, baby. Yeah, we drove, we drove over this arch. This rock arch is huge, huge, like, rock. And, it, like, it had this hole where we just fit. Like, the, the ferry just fit. And, oh, my gosh, those swells were freaking me out. Like, it was it – was, it's a work of art. Honestly. All right, let's talk about this, too, as we get cl- close to wrapping this up. The, the views that you saw today in the ancient times were reserved for imperial friends and family. How lucky are we to be, able to, to be able to just to land here, f- set, you know, cruise over there, and then just march us up to the top? And uh, people that, w- I mean, people could have only imagined in the, in the past, you know, working maybe down below, working in, in the fish shops and the, you know, dragging nets for a living. And then, you know, maybe, maybe somebody gets to haul stuff up to the, to the, to the royalty, but never get to stand there and just admire the beauty like we did today. Like that means something to me, yeah. you know? All right. This last thing, you're going to give me a 30 second pitch. You're going to talk to the underclassmen. Maybe they're in ninth grade right now. 
maybe they're seventh grade, and you're going to convince them that these trips are worth going on. Got about, yeah, a little propaganda here. <laughs> but no, be, be truthful. What would you tell, you say, no, it's too tiring. Don't do it. <laughs> Stay home. No. What would, you, what would you tell somebody thinking about going on these trips? Condense it down to like your best pitch. Okay. Go. It's tiring in a good way, but I think for me, at least, there, there are two parts to it. The first one is definitely history because I love history. And if you have any inclination at all, if you have any interest, there's, there's a really special feeling to see things you learn about and to actually, like, extend your knowledge uh, through your own eyes. And there, you can't you, – there's no way to, to uh, substitute that. And also, I'd say just, like, the, like the bonding because, like, like, Dario, you know, like the tour guy, like, you – you know, and, and all the people you're with and your teachers, it, it's just like a great experience, you know. It's like one of those family experiences. So you can't really get it in, an, in another place. I, I was going somewhere just like where he went about the history thing. Just pay attention in your history classes because it, it makes an experience like this even better if you can tie in historical significance with what you're seeing. Because I feel like there are some people, but there's some people in every group that will see something like what we saw. And they can't experience the same, um, I got the same yeah, the same feelings to the level that you are just because of the knowledge of history that we've gotten in school. And it, it, it is, it, it's indescribable. You just have to be able to make that connection. Yeah, I mean, history, history doesn't just make you a more knowledgeable person. It just makes you a better person in general. Uh, honestly, from what I, from what I've seen is, uh, it really makes you a well-rounded person, and going on these trips really gives you an opportunity to apply that, uh, and just to kind of see firsthand what you've been learning about in the classroom. Uh, and again, it, you can't really put that into words. And also, kind of Noah touched on this, but the relationships you build with the people that you're spending seven, eight, nine days with is 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 pretty. I mean, I mean, I, there's just no other place. I mean, there's no other place for it because. You, you know, you're kind of stuck with each other. You gotta get, I mean, you're pretty close. Mm. But um, it's really been such a pleasure to just, like, just hanging with the boys, like, it, just going, yeah, hanging th good. hanging with Rome, paddling, you know, like, uh, you know, to, like all this stuff. See, here's the thing. You guys will have inside jokes that nobody else will have. Oh, you'll yeah, be able to, absolutely. something something will happen, some reference will come up, you'll see a thing, and you'll, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> wink, <laughs> wakey, wakey, you know, is it, just, uh, you'll just, just some, just, <laughs> They'll just be this thing, and you'll just kind of give each other the side eye, and you're like, mm-hmm. Uh, Nobody else knows what's going on, which is just Dial. great, you know? Yeah. Dial. So, but here's the other thing, too. Like, we can talk about it in class all day long. You can see documentaries. You can see videos. You can hit what. But y until you do it, you don't really know. And no one can ever take that away from you now. It's going to be inside you, right? You're going to carry that with you in your heart, and that's awesome.